few days ago a friend in the US sent me this very nice piece of equipment so thanks for this Dave it's much appreciated it uh, will make a very nice addition to the lab and uh, for anyone that doesn't recognize it this is of course a 488 GPIB bus analyzer now when he sent it he did tell me it had a fault and um, I must confess I have now repaired this it was quite an easy repair, it took about half an hour, but um, it turned out to be fairly interesting, so I thought I would post this video. I don't have the proper power connector for this, it uses a 180 degree 5 pin DIN connector. And uh, I've got some on order, but for now I've just got it hooked up to a couple of test leads. And I kind of suspect that this odd power connector may be what uh, started this fault in the first place. I'll come back to that later on. First I'll show you what this is actually doing and um, as I have repaired it but I've kind of returned it to how it was uh, kind of um, but it's now showing the same fault for the same reason so I'll tilt up the display hopefully you can see it okay and uh, we'll power this up and you'll see the fault I saw at first I won't leave it on too long for reasons I'll explain later so you power it up and it comes up with RAM error and it will do that every time hopefully you can see that Um, I have also upgraded the firmware in this, it was 1.4 when I got it, it's now 1.5 but that is not related to the fault. So before we go any further I'll open this up and show you what's inside and then we'll go back and I'll explain uh, what I found and um, what the cause was. Okay so two major parts, you've got the keyboard and display this comes off as a single unit. Looks like it's broken here, but uh, this is because the display tilts. We'll have a look at that once it's reassembled. Uh, but quite a simple keyboard and display. And I didn't uh, think there was any issues with that. So looking inside, as I say, I have um, updated the firmware. I haven't put a sticker on this yet, but um, we also have the processor, the ROM, some interface chips, a timer and then this row of chips along the front uh, and this one are some uh, programmable logic devices and PALs and I was hoping it wasn't a fault with those. I've got the code for these but they're a bit of a pain to get hold of. Um, but uh, looking at the nature of the fault I didn't think it was that. We have the three RAM chips, We've got these two that are connected as a pair and then this standalone one. Now they're all really equivalent types, but this one was a different uh, type manufacturer to these two. And they were, they were all soldered to the board, so um, and there was no sign it had been replaced in the past. So I suspect it was original. So when I fitted the replacements, these are all new chips now. Um, although they're not the same type that was fitted, they are pin equivalents. Um, but I did maintain the um, timing relationships of the same speed SRAMs that were fitted originally. So for anyone interested this is the type of device uh, that was fitted and as I say I have replaced it with a slightly easier to obtain version but they are uh, pin equivalent so there shouldn't be any issues there. Um, so the way this circuit's laid out there is of course some um, battery backed RAM and normally with battery back RAM you need some sort of um, CMOS battery controller. Now this battery you can see at the back in the socket um, that wasn't there when I got the unit and this IC that's missing here I pulled that out to simulate the fault that I was seeing. Um, this is the battery that was fitted it was just tacked to the board so I think at some point this has been replaced there's also a little wire jumper on here that wasn't original so I think this had been replaced at some point maybe as part of this uh, fault um, but rather than keep soldering batteries to the board I fitted a coin cell holder and I put in the coin cell. I'll now refit the device that was in here. We'll reassemble the unit and I'll show you what effect replacing the battery had. I also replaced the DRAM at the front. I put a scope on this and it was not returning any data so I replaced this device originally uh, ultimately I replaced these two as well because one of the pair was not really working very well so 
uh, I'll replace that, but I don't think it was directly part of the fault. So I'll get this reassembled. Okay, so we're reassembled. The device is now refitted and the fault we'll see now is what fault I was seeing after I'd replaced the SRAM and fitted the backup battery. We're now getting NVRAM error. The way the system operates is um, the NVRAM error is when it's getting garbage from the NVRAM. The unit then writes some default data to the um, NVRAM and it continues, which is why it is now apparently working. So it's once you get past that point, it actually starts to operate and do what uh, you'd expect it to. So, okay, so the issue we have now is um, if we power this back on, I'm not going to turn it back on, and the reason is that um, the nature of the fault with this device in its current state, this is the device that was fitted, it was sold to the board, I fitted a socket, but the problem with this is that um, it's not providing any power to the RAM chip and um, at first I thought that just one of those three chips would be battery backed and the way these devices work, this is a, a DS1210 and now it's a simple uh, CMOS battery backup controller so Really what it's got inside is a couple of uh, steering diodes. You apply main 5 volt power to one of the inputs. You apply the voltage from the battery to another input and um, that decides um, which power source is used to power the uh, RAM chip. You turn the main power off, it switches over to the um, backup battery. But it also has a circuit inside to control the chip select line of the SRAM because of course if you let the um, the power drop completely on the entire board including the chip select line then not only will the main power um, control go down but you'll also lower the right um, enable line and also the chip select line and that will cause spurious writes to the RAM chip so the way that the controller chip works is it's pulls the chip select line high as soon as it sees the main power starting to drop. And that means that normally there's a connection uh, chip select in that comes from the main control circuit and is then passed through to the RAM so that the system can control the SRAM. But when you turn the power off it pulls that chip select line high and also provides uh, backup power from the battery but I buzzed it out and there weren't any connections from this to the, uh, the RAM that I thought was uh, battery back which is the one that had failed. So digging around some more I found quite an unusual circuit so I'll just quickly sketch out what I found. So it turned out that as well as the RAM that I'd originally replaced and this is the one I suspected was um, connected to the control chip the um, CMOS control chip, there were the other pair, so this is a pair, they're wired as a pair, presumably for 16-bit operation, and so the two chip select lines on the pair are connected together. We've got another chip select line on this device, now of course they need to be separated, you can't join these together, otherwise the system would have no way to select which one it wanted because chances are the data and address buses are connected together. You could of course put buffers in here but that's not really a good solution. It also turned out that the power for all three devices were connected together and that would have gone back to, in fact did go back, I buzzed it out, it did go back to our controller chip. So I draw the controller chip, the pinout's not as I'm going to draw it but this is just for the sake of this explanation. So it's a, an 8 pin device and effectively it has a couple of diodes inside it 
and so it's partly configured like this. Now you'd normally provide your 5 volt supply to one of these inputs and you'd connect a battery to the other one. So this forms your battery backup and when the main power goes off it uh, obviously reverts over to the backup battery and that provides power to the device. But of course you need some way to control the chip select line to stop these spurious writes. And normally in this device you have um, a transistor that is connected to one of the um, outputs and this also senses the incoming voltage and it controls this uh, transistor and normally you'd have something like this so what will happen is this would normally be connected to your chip select line on your RAM and so when the main power is sensed going off not only does it switch over to the backup battery but it also uh, pulls the chip select line high and that disables the device and stops any spurious writes. That's not how this was wired up because there are two chip select lines and also I found that an additional thing you need by the way is an input so you'd normally have chip select in and this would be your chip select out so that the system, the main system would feed its chip select signal in here and then that would allow it to uh, control the SRAM and then when the power goes off this is pulled high to protect the data. But that's not how this was wired. The chip select in was actually connected directly to 0 volts. Which is kind of strange but that wouldn't prevent the chip select out line from doing its thing. That should still go high when the power goes off. But the way this was arranged and I buzzed around the board is there were a couple of OR gates that control the chip select line for the two devices and a couple of the inputs one input on each gate is connected to the chip select out so whenever this goes high then of course these two lines go high and it turns out that all three devices are battery backed so power goes off it switches over to ba uh, battery backup to provide power for all three of the SRAMs and also the chip select outline goes high and through the OR gates the output of the OR gates goes high to protect the data in all three devices and then the main control, the main machine has the two chip select lines you've got chip select 1 and chip select 2 so when the power is applied this line goes low through the controller device this will go low and is now controlled through the other input so if this goes high this goes high if this goes low this goes low so that's how it's wired up but of course the uh, additional complication is this particular device also needs to be battery backed otherwise it couldn't do uh, its thing when the main power goes off so quite an unusual arrangement but it does work very well and it explains now why we're getting this NVRAM error. If this isn't working and we're not getting power through, which is what the original fault was, then we get a RAM error. If it's not doing its thing and pulling the line high as it should, we'll get an NVRAM error because we'll lose the contents of the SRAM each time the power's turned off. And that's what was happening. So to fix it, of course, what you could do is just drop in a new... 1210. Um, so this is actually going to be cracking it. So I think um, what happened to this is at some point, because of the unusual power connector, either power has been connected incorrectly um, or uh, over voltage has uh, been applied. So it's expecting 5 volts in, which again is fairly unusual. So possibly someone fed 12 volts in or something like that, and that obviously will destroy this. This is across the um, power input. So um, big crack in this, you can see this under the microscope as you can see there's a big crack all the way across this um, now I do have some of these spare but because the chip select input's not being used which is one of the, the only real complicated bits of that device um, we can make our own so what's actually in that device if we ignore the chip select in is a circuit like this so it's very simple we have the two steering diodes that provide power uh, out to the SRAM 
depending on whether there's main power applied and if there isn't it reverts to the battery backup and then we have this uh, small circuit and as the um, incoming plus 5 volt drops below around 4.7 volts this transistor will start to turn off and because it's turning off the collector will start to float and then through this resistor the chip select line will be pulled high when power is applied the transistor turns on pulls this line low which of course pulls the chip select line low so it does exactly what we need so rather than just dropping in a replacement DS1210 getting fairly hard to get hold of these days you can get them on eBay they again can be expensive so as we don't really need the complexity of the chip select control what we can do is make up our own and if we translate that circuit into a layout on an 8 pin um, prototype header we end up with something like this so of course I've made one up so this is effectively a uh, DS1210 so I'll get this plugged in okay so that's our DS1210 replacement plugged in and we'll try powering this up and see if we've cured the problem now the first time we power this up we will get an NVRAM error because it did contain uh, nonsense from the previous time we powered it up when we didn't have a working um, controller so we'll now try to cycle the power but this time it should just straight through and start up without the error and it does so we'll try that a few times just to show that it wasn't a fluke so that is now fully functional so it now works the way it should do okay and since I repaired it I have fully tested this and it does work exactly as it should um, so what it required was uh, three um, SRAM chips I suspect it only needed one but um, I've replaced all three anyway a replacement DS1210 in our case one that we've made and of course the replacement backup battery so quite a low cost repair quite an interesting one and uh, so I'll get this reassembled so you can see how it looks when it's in one piece so that's how it looks when it's reassembled very nice little unit the display tilts up as you can see you can set it to whatever angle you want and then it folds flat when you're not using it so we'll power this back up and as you can see it's working fine looking through the camera viewfinder it looks like the display might be appearing to flicker but uh, that's just the camera as ever it's not evident in real life um, but this is now working the way it's supposed to and we can set whatever values we want and I have as I say fully tested this and it works absolutely perfectly so um, very nice unit thanks again Dave for this it's uh, much appreciated very nice unit I'll just now give it a final clean and then it can go into uh, active service.